Welcome everyone to this recorded lecture. Um, something different today. Um, the lecture um, is going to be a little shorter than usual. You'll be pleased to hear. Um, and because I'm, it's essentially going to be um, a case of uh, me talking through the slides, but also, um, you know, as always, I will elaborate on some of the the key themes. But it's different from being actually in the classroom environment. So, um, when you're listening to this recording, uh, be aware that it won't be as long as a normal lecture because we don't have the same uh, form of interaction. However, uh, be aware that under the the lecture slides that will be posted on the Moodle site, there is a discussion board that is there for you to field any questions or points of clarification or even any comments that you have on the material that I'll be talking about in this in this lecture. So basically the lecture today is to focus on the communication uh, aspects of crisis management. In terms of a overview, the, can, the main themes are really to think about um, communication, both in terms of how that has an impact on the response to a crisis in an internal and external way uh, from an organisational point of view, uh, and also to kind of think about uh, blame games and how these are a feature of the crisis management process, often a feature of the crisis management process at the response phase. Uh, when the action happens in terms of making decisions and uh, and who's responsible for making decisions and trying to navigate through that. But also it's a feature of post-crisis politics, the crisis aftermath whereby individuals, actors, agencies are held to account for their actions and what they did during a crisis. And often there's a little bit of gaming involved whereby crisis management actors might try and play down their role or play down their level of culpability uh, for what went wrong uh, whereas uh, it could actually work in other ways as well that certain actors want to present themselves as doing particularly well during a crisis because it may actually enhance their level of credibility or it might have political dimensions to it. A politician or political actor will want to make it clear or shout from the roof, rooftops in many ways uh, if things go well uh, during a crisis. Okay, So basically those are the types of themes that we'll be looking at in the lecture. First and foremost, it's important to kind of identify why this is important. You know, Why are, are communications important during a crisis? Well, many would argue uh, in the crisis literature that it's a, cr a crucial component um, of decision making. And that the facilitation and management of communications is something that is a core area of business when it comes to responding to a crisis. Boyne and colleagues uh, identify this um, in their quote when they argue that in today's age of high speed and global mass communication, a crisis necessitates immediate and comprehensive public information and communication activities. So simply put, governments need to tell people what's going on what is happening next and what it means to them. Failure to do so in a timely and authoritative manner opens up a Pandora's box of journalistic and web-based speculation, rumour, suspicion and allegations that can easily flame public opinion and sour the political climate. And these are very important um, dimensions and also uh, I think we have to bear in mind that these days with the prevalence of social media that there is an increased speed upon which information is demanded but also transmitted across different mediums and I think the that dimension is important to bear in mind um, in this day and age but at any level even before the advent of social media uh, there is a requirement for organisations to communicate in some way to the masses about what's being done to dampen uncertainty to control the situation, to make societal actors feel that the government is responding in the, in, the most, in the most effective way. You might hear crisis actors um, talking about feeding the beast when it comes to the provision of information and often what they, they refer to there is the media because whenever there's a newsworthy item, a crisis is a newsworthy item, the media will want to get on top of the information 
they will want to be able to be in a position of sharing information broadly with the public and that means that the media can become quite intrusive and demanding in requiring that information and feeding the beast is often what crisis managers refer to when it comes to actually just giving the media enough information for them to to go away and to um, to transmit that information in the most appropriate way. They might not convey all the information um, that the crisis manager has, but it's enough within that given context to kind of stem the demands from the beast, if you like, that is the media. But on the other hand, the media isn't necessarily something that can be regarded as a beast at all times, because the media can be a very useful resource um, for the government, particularly when it comes to um, providing reassurances to the public that things are being done. So you remember that after uh, the death of Princess Diana um, in the mid-90s, that basically Tony Blair came out, the Prime Minister at the time, and said, you know, she was a people's princess. You know, he came out on TV to try and dampen the levels of of anxiety amongst the public at that time, um, and that's a that's a the, the people's princess has been something that's became something of a dominant uh, symbol, if you like, a, a symbol within language of conveying um, political leadership in many ways um, in response to that crisis. So the media was the means by which Tony Blair gave out that information and it meant everyone had the same message, everyone had access to that message and that meant that the media became a very useful uh, feature, if you like, of the crisis response. So it's very important to bear in mind that the, the communications in crisis is a very important aspect of crisis mint. Facilitating communications, um, of course, uh, is an important activity um, and making institutional actors who are within organisations actually know what's happening because we can't assume that all organisational actors internally in an organisation or an agency um, have the same information or access to the same information all the time. So there has to be a level of internal uh, communication um, and it's also important that that communication is provided to wider societal actors as well because like we said before this idea of confidence and ensuring that uncertainty is dampened is a very important act an important political act in many respects Drennan and McConnell highlight the idea that communications have these internal and external dimensions internally contingency plans and protocols are often a key communication device that are available to internal actors um, in terms of understanding what the processes might be in the response phase. Contingency plans are actually generally accessible by the public more broadly, but it's going to be those on the inside, it's going to be those internal crisis actors that will be more au fait to understanding the content, particularly if they've been involved in crisis management exercises and so on. Okay. Communication also tends to revolve around informal hubs, protocols and so on. And it's important that in, operational, in an operational sense, in response to a crisis, that stakeholder groups, frontline teams, through the media, are able to convey and communicate attempts to resolve the crisis. The other dimension to this is that stakeholder groups might be privileged in terms of the access to information that they have. So when Grant 2004 he talks about the role of pressure groups and the role of insider groups versus outsider groups. So insider groups are those that have access to the bureaucracy, those that have access to decision makers and it might be that these groups have access to information that say other groups don't necessarily have access to. So for example if it came to something like a public health risk or crisis, so it, say for example the UK government's response to the Ebola crisis, the British Medical Association would have direct contact with the bureaucracy and understanding what the response needs to be, but also the BMA uh, would also be a key actor that the state draws upon in term, given their expertise in understanding the contours of a disease crisis. So that 
relationship, by virtue of that relationship, they have access, privileged access to information in many senses. So this kind of relationship um, in terms of the role of stakeholder groups, it will be advantageous um, for officials and the bureaucracy in many ways in understanding the social and economic consequences of their decisions at what we call a street level. Another way to describe that would be at an operational level. So the information provided by stakeholders can have implications for the course of action implemented by the government during a crisis. So an example of this is regard to the National Farmers Union during animal disease outbreaks. So for example, if there's an avian flu outbreak or a foot and mouth outbreak or a BSC outbreak or a bovine TB out outbreak, the National Farmers Union is heavily involved in discussing with stakeholders broadly um, within the farming community, but stakeholders within government as well about the crisis management decision making process and what the National Farmers Union can do to communicate with its members about what to do more locally in terms of things like disease control, the procedures for containing disease and so on. We need to bear in mind that organisations like the National Farmers Union and the British Medical Association are often representers or representatives in many ways of different groups. They're often a, a key forum, if you like, and convey the, the message from and to its members. So that's a very useful tool by the government because they can actually call upon these actors to cascade information to its members and other actors. So an example more broadly in terms of communication is in terms of the kind of institutional cross-cutting forms of communications between different groups and agencies. For example, those on the ground um, that might be affected by a disease crisis, such as the farming community, can be assured or provided with key information of unfolding events. Um, and there's different mechanisms for this to happen. Um, of course, we have television, we have text messaging, we've got the internet and radio. SMS text messaging is something that um, the, the government, the UK government, has tried to um, enhance in many senses in terms of response uh, to crises. They will require farmers, for example, to provide um, a mobile phone uh, number so that they can actually have instant communication when there has been a, an outbreak or notification um, of uh, an outbreak uh, by another farm and so on. But obviously these issues um, there are issues here in terms of the extent to which these communication tools are effective because we can't necessarily assume that all farmers have access to a mobile phone or access to a good uh, internet connection or a good mobile phone connection. So there's a range of, of questions around the inequalities of communication and the extent to which communication can be just regarded as something that's there and accessible by all at all times. We can't necessarily assume that. Um, but Drennan and McConnell um, identify that there are problems and challenges um, more widely in terms of multiple messages containing different forms of information. Information applicable to one area may be received by another but not necessarily applicable to another. Inappropriate communication tools might actually be evident. Like I say, it might be that there's a lack of internet connection across certain rural areas that make it very difficult for street level actors on the ground to get access to information. Okay. So crises really do put communications to the test. So I'll give you just an example here from foot and mouth. You know, interviews, parliamentary proceedings of the Select Committee on the Environment and the what we call the Anderson Inquiry, which was the main inquiry into the foot and mouth crisis, showed that external and internal communications were flawed during the crisis. For example, um, a DEFRA official confirmed that hasty decisions had been made and often on a non-transparent basis. That non-transparency is really not, not what you want to have when it comes to um, a transparent decision making and communication process. So one of the uh, recommendations to come out of the Anderson inquiry was that stakeholder engagement ensures, needs to ensure that 
the government is not out of out of touch in many ways with the industry. And what this actually highlights is that it's not necessarily about what happens in the crisis phase or in the decision making phase that is important here. It's actually what happens beforehand in the relationships you build beforehand with the industry and the communications that you put in place from an early early stage. Essentially what happened was the government during the foot and mouth crisis didn't actually understand how the industry operated, the agricultural industry operated and that was really really important in terms of putting in, in place disease control measures because you have to understand how the industry operates, how animals are transmitted between different sections of the of the industry, how that might actually have an impact on your ability to con control disease. So it's these types of communication that are important and it actually taps into what we call intelligence gathering. Okay, So that's a key form of communication in the pre-crisis phase that if you get it right can help when it comes to, to the decision making process at the response phase. So one of the interviewees um, who was responsible in many ways for um, dealing with and resolving um, the crisis uh, from the kind of bureaucratic side of things um, identified that I have been in the game a little while now and I have a duty to understand these processes and use them. They are there for a reason. In the old math it was quite easy for hasty decisions to be made. Decisions would be made behind closed doors. Civil service, uh, several servants sorry, would decide what is good for the industry and decisions would be made without fully being fully aware of the facts and not taking everyone's view into consideration. Things would go, go wrong and the government would get the blame. So there's a, this really evokes a sense of Whitehall being quite inward looking not externally facing, that they know best, they don't need to communicate, they don't need to cast their stakeholder net more widely to gather up information about what to do during a crisis. That was a key problem for what was the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food that was in place before DEFRA came along. So the lack of diffusion of information to stakeholders whose cooperation is essential in times of crisis especially if the crisis has vast economic and social implications, was criticised by the Anderson Inquiry into Foot and Mouth. It went on to recommend that in the interests of all sectors, what they said was likely to bear the brunt of any costs, should be properly represented and taken into account when designing policies options to control animal disease outbreaks. In other words, how can we ensure that when it comes to policy making, that we make sure that there's a representative process that underpins it. Ensuring that it's not one or two actors inside the bureaucracy that are making these autocratic decisions for everyone. We need to ensure that the interests, the talents, the expertise of the actors involved and affected by a crisis are also part of pre-crisis planning and decision making. Okay, so. Furthermore, the inquiry indicated that wider stakeholder engagement is something that could be should be considered in the pre-crisis phase. And this was something that was raised by the Parliamentary Committee as well, um, into foot and mouth. You know, we have select committees in the Westminster Parliament that often have key subject areas of interest that they are in charge of, or that they have uh, a remit over. And the Environment Committee, after the foot and mouth crisis was very heavily involved in discussing the lessons that should be learned uh, from foot and mouth. In terms of external communication, you know, with respect to the use of communications technology, um, journalists and members of the public told the inquiry team, the Anderson inquiry team, that the website was frequently out of date and inaccurate. Farmers in Cumbria, t which was a key uh, unfortunately a key area that was heavily affected by foot and mouth um, told the inquiry that when it was obvious that the website was out of date or inaccurate they would call the helpline but the information provided by uh, the helpline um, was no different because to that of the website because the staff were also using the same information on the website too so there was a real issue there in terms of the extent to which information is updated and the extent to which that information is affected. In terms of the institutional level issues, um, we have to kind of think back to what we were discussing earlier on in the module in terms of resilience 
and how actors come together and work together um, during a crisis in a resilient fashion. Internal communication is very important in this respect as well. Um, there were communication problems between the State Veterinary Service on the ground, the Ministry of Agriculture's regional centres across the country, and MAF at a central government department level in Whitehall. Just to note that the State Veterinary Service is the, was a key operational arm of the response, obviously made up of, of key government vets who were in charge of actually trying to stem the control of the disease on the ground. So it was the State Veterinary Service that would undertake things like mass culling um, of affected animals and so on. So crucial communication channels should have been tested before the crisis to ensure the integration of communications within and between administrative units. And this is this is something that is bread and butter to those um, theorists who talk about resilience, who suggest that, that communication is core business. Communication is something that should always be there between administrative units um, during a crisis. So it's crucial that in responding to a crisis that communications allow for those on the ground and at the centre to be confident in knowing who's, in actually, who's actually in charge of coordinating the response. For the first two months of the 2001 foot and mouth outbreak, there were serious deficiencies in the reliability of information available to those in charge and simultaneously, those on the ground did not know where the bucks actually stopped. David Curry, who perhaps has his own political perspectives on this given the fact that um, he was in opposition um, during the time of the foot and mouth crisis and is a former Conservative Agricultural Minister, um, but he, he brings uh, into the spotlight the issues to do with communication and obviously he had experience of working within the Ministry of Agriculture uh, before foot and mouth happened and this is what he had to say. Mm -hmm. The means of communications are vitally important. Communications should be automatic and should spring into action as soon as there is a suspicion of an outbreak and there should not be delays. What went wrong with the lines of communication from when the disease was suspected and the speed of res the response and the volume of the response? The reason that went wrong was idiot things like someone being away on a Friday, they failed to put in place really effective structures of control and command so that people could go to one place and get the information. One of the big things was that farmers couldn't find out what was happening. They needed someone who could direct administrators and vets into one single manoeuvre. The thing I remember the most about that outbreak as a constituency MP is that nobody knew what they were doing. You didn't know where the buck stopped. Although I did say David Curry might have his own political reasons for attacking the government um, on this issue given the fact that he was a member of the Conservative Party and the key, key political crisis managers doing foot and mouth were New Labour. Um, new, uh, Nick Brown, who was the New Labour Minister in charge um, initially even um, of responding to the foot and mouth crisis, did also admit that there were key uh, links that were weak in communication systems and indicated that communica communication systems in Whitehall were not fit for purpose in 2001. But, interestingly, Brown argued that this isn't something that was particularly unique to the Ministry of Agriculture, and that other government departments um, had the same uh, experience. But unfortunately, what a crisis does is expose those weak links. It might be that other government departments might not have been exposed to the same extent before. However, what MAF, unfortunately for them, were exposed for were their poor communication systems during the crisis because they became subject to considerable scrutiny in this area. That's foot and mouth, but some of these themes will be of relevance to the case studies that you've identified to look at for your assignments and it's something that you might want to reflect on because in any uh, crisis often a lesson learned or something that's identified by a parliamentary committee or an inquiry report is often to do with how a, how a communications operated at an internal and external level how effective were communications in, in supporting the crisis management process what were the deficiencies what could have worked better so these are 
the issues that you could also consider with assignment two, bearing in mind that assignment two gets us to think about what lessons can be learned uh, from your chosen case studies. So have a think about this element of communication and apply it to your own work. It's also important to consider um, when it comes to crisis management, other dimensions of communication. You'll see um, from some some writings um, on the politics of crisis and actually politics more generally and issues to do with looking at policy fiascos is aspects of communication relating to political language and the role of political language and the importance of that um, and the need for political actors to use polit political language in a certain way to convey a certain image about how the government is responding to a situation. Murray Edelman is a very important writer in the area of political language and basically his central thesis is that the use of political language by elites in making claims can also serve to add to levels of obfuscation and political dramaturgy. Um, so basically what Murray Edelman argues is that political um, language is a key device and tool for policy makers and trying to kind of avoid blame in many senses or to evoke a sense of significant or excellent performance by themselves often in contrast to the opposition in many respects. He notes that every administration finds it politically useful to claim that its policies are working. There is, accordingly, a systematic deflation in governmental rhetoric of the developments that call, call attention to unequal distribution to good, goods or services and a systematic inflation of the forms of threat that legitimise and expand authority. The latter are defined as crises, the former as problems. As crises recur and problems persist, so does a governmental dramaturgy of coping. But what that kind of evokes a sense of is this idea of strategising as well, because language is going to be key, isn't it, to how policy actors strategise um, when it comes to dealing with a public policy problem, fiasco or crisis. We can see this um, quite recently in some of the debates over rendition. Uh, the issue of rendition uh, has really cast a long shadow over the actions of policymakers as a, a result of suspicions, including those by pressure groups such as Reprieve and Liberty. I've put the link to Reprieve down there um, in, the, in the slide. Uh, you can have a look at that website. Um, and sections of the media as well. And accusations by those actually subject to this rendition i.e. so-called terrorism suspects, that UK officials and the intelligence services have been complicit in aiding and abetting the torture of those detained under anti-terror legislation in the post-9-11 era. So there's been real questions about the role of the UK intelligence services in rendition um, and the extent to which they have been um, colluding uh, in many respects in this process. Prime Minister Tony Blair was actually questioned on BBC Radio 4 about um, MI6 um, and, and rendering uh, a prominent Libyan dissident to the Gaddafi regime in 2004, which was during um, Tony Blair's premiership. Uh, and Tony Blair says that he had no recollection of the incident and that as far as he knew, the UK government maintained a position of not supporting rendition. So as far as he knew, could be a significant use of political language in many respects. He's not saying it didn't happen. What he's saying is, as far as he knew. Okay. The investigation report into rendition, which was published in December 2013, which was headed up by Sir Peter Gibson, into the government's actions in, relating, in relation to rendition, concluded that he could not find evidence of the UK being directly, inverted commas, involved in the torture or rendition of terrorism suspects. However, the scope of this inquiry, and he admits this himself, the scope of the inquiry was limited and served to raise further questions about the level of complicity of UK security services. And this is an issue that's been quite contemporary. I would, I would uh, encourage you to have a, a Google search and a kind of quick um, look um, to interrogate this issue um, because it is something that's quite 
um, contemporary and it calls into question government involvement um, and and such a thing um, but also it calls into question um, the extent to which the government is involved in something that could be regarded as a fiasco in many senses but the, related to this actually is some of the other developments is that ministers are now are able to decide if cases brought against the security services or the intelligence services involving rendition are to take place under something called a closed material procedure it's a legal procedure which allows these cases to be brought in private and free from wider scrutiny and they're not subject to freedom of information so it means that this level of transparency uh, or so-called transparency if you like or the lack of it means that it raises further questions about the extent to which um, there has been involvement uh, in rendition so again the use of strategizing political language um, is something to be very careful of and mindful of when studying case studies particularly those uh, the use of language by political actors in trying to ensure that or downplay the action of government in certain ways and to pot potentially avoid culpability for certain activities it doesn't end there however the political fuzziness and the use of language doesn't end there because we can also talk about this notion of fuzzy governance as well so we know from earlier in the module when we're talking about multi-level aspects of crisis management we were talking about multi-level governance which basically meant the dispersal of actors and decision making channels across multiple levels of governance and really what that helps us think about is an element of complexity you know it's quite complex to think of multi-level governance because you've got different levels and tiers of government and actors permeate a range of those tiers decision making channels aren't unidirectional they just don't come down from the top down they can also come from the bottom up and transcend multiple levels of governance which makes things a little bit complex um, and actually in a recent article um, and which is on the middle site and is a pre key uh, pre-read um, for the seminar next week is by Batch and, uh, and colleagues who basically discuss the transport uh, transport policy and specifically discuss transport related carbon reductions in response to the Climate Change Act 2008 and basically by using this lens of multi-level governance uh, they look at the carbon plan that came out of the Climate Change Act and they basically argue that the carbon plan exposed the existence of a governance vacuum between the statutory targets associated with climate change and a very weak devolved implementation system okay so the implementation system wasn't st strong enough and needed to be strengthened but the main point for us here isn't really about the intricacies of the carbon plan it's actually about the wider questions that batch and uh, colleagues raise is this idea of fuzzy governance because fuzzy governance can lead to fuzzy accountability which can make it very difficult um, to hold actors to account if they exist within a complex network or a complex process it becomes very fuzzy so this fuzziness can lead to ambiguity so is this ripe therefore for blame gaming and this is a key aspect of the politics of communication this idea of blame gaming and culpability avoidance so the blame game has been a recurring feature of post-crisis politics uh, in many respects uh, the blame game refers to interactions between actors who seek to protect their self-interest rather than to serve the common good and you'll see this in the literature and references have been provided here so the blame game involves interactions between two sex sections of act actors or two sets of actors so the blamed on the one hand and the blamers on the other right including the blame shifters and the shifties right so it might be that when things go wrong that policymakers accept responsibility and embark upon changing the situation but however Brandstrom and colleagues argue that most policy actors and policy makers will try to avoid being linked to a problem and if they come under criticism for alleged policy failures then they will try to escape blame and deflect, deflect it onto others so the party then 
the party then accused will also engage in a process of deflection. So this develops into a blame game, which represents a verbal struggle between protagonists inside and outside the government about the allocation of responsibility for negative events. So this is a, a recurring feature of the politics of the crisis aftermath. These defensive attitudes by actors inhibit change in many respects as a result of the fact that such behaviour deflects due attention from poor performance management and learning systems within public institutions. So blame games can lead to defensive actions, which those defensive actions can get in the way of getting to the root problem, get in the way of identifying the lessons that should be learned for the future. There are also key blame game settings in many respects um, that often take place within political institutions. Um, we, can always, we can regard the mass media in many respects as an institution in some senses, but in more traditional senses, parliaments, um, we can see how actors are called in to, uh, called to give evidence and to account for their actions within parliamentary settings. It could be within the plenary chamber within the House of Commons, you might see that at Prime Minister's questions where opposition parties put questions to uh, the government ministers and the Prime Minister over what the actions have been uh, in resolving crises. Um, we can see it within the Parliamentary Select Committees as well, we've already talked about the Environment Committee, but also the Home Affairs Com Select Committee has been uh, very useful in terms of calling into question uh, the role of officials within, say, the Home Office or the Borders Agency uh, for certain actions that they've undertaken with regards to things like border control or the investigation into um, historical uh, sex abuse um, within uh, within certain departments and certain um, establishments. And uh, the parliamentary committees have also been very useful uh, in terms of the role of the Public Accounts Committee. And the, and the Public of, public Administration Committee in terms of calling into question the decisions of agencies and officials in terms of how they've used monies and public money uh, with regards to uh, their departments and what they've basically used public money for. The Basically, the main theme here is that parliaments are often a key forum for accountability. Although they're a key forum for accountability, it might actually be the setting in which blame games actually actually happen. Inquiry settings are, are something that we will come back to um, in a future lecture, but you know, simply an inquiry, the, by virtue of the fact that it's been set up, means that it's investigating something. It's investigating what went well, what went wrong during a crisis uh, situation. It'll often be uh, during the process of giving evidence to an inquiry that political actors will see the opportunity to undertake a, a process of culpability avoidance and blame games um, in many respects because the findings of an inquiry can make or break a political career in many respects and we'll come back to that in a minute. The mass media, of course, the mass media obviously, um, you know, media often has political leanings as you know um, we have social media that um, is something, you know, via Facebook and Twitter that gives instant um, information um, to, to the public and blame games can happen um, within those forums as well. Um, mass media, we have journalists who undertake investigatory forms of journalism who might try to uncover um, certain actions and things that went wrong. So the, the MP's expenses scandal is an example of that where the, the Telegraph um, took a significant role in exposing the actions of, of politicians and the misuse of expenses. Uh, but often what you would find is those uh, parliamentarians who had been accused of using their expenses in uh, the incorrect way, they would often turn around and say, well, it wasn't me, it was the system that allowed it to happen in the first place. So it's not my fault, it's actually the process that that underpins the expenses system. So, you know, there can be an element of, you know, not taking individual personal responsibility for your actions if the system itself allows for those actions to uh, to happen. But those accused, those political actors accused, will make sure that they identify that it was the process, it was the structures, it was the system 
that was at fault rather than those individually, particularly if they've got a stake in whether or not they're found out um, for what they've uh, what they've been doing. So culpability avoidance, blame games can happen within a range of different settings. So this issue of accountability is important and I would encourage you to look at some of Richard uh, Mulgan's work who discusses the nature of accountability and the different ways of understanding this concept. Um, Boyne uh, and colleagues often also discuss the links between accountability and post-crisis learning. They note that accountability forums such as parliaments and committee settings often take an explicit interest in encouraging the government to draw lessons for the future. But that's all set within a process of accountability. But we'll come back to the issues to do with inquiries and accountability later in the module. Just to say a few more things about blame games. Um, another source that um, we've I've basically asked students to uh, to read in advance of the seminar next week is the Brandstrom and Cooper's um, analysis of the politicisation of policy failures because um, it gives us quite an interesting insight into how policy failures are politicised and they also identify this following point that accountability and blame assignment affect the political realm. If during the reconstruction process the incident is recast as a product of failures of public officials or agencies, this involves specific temporal, spatial and causal representations of the problem which highlight the responsibility of some and minimise the responsibilities of others. So that's what they kind of identify as an important theme here um, in the politicisation of policy failures. But it's important to bear in mind that even in so-called non-crisis studies in the social sciences, the importance of blame games have been identified. So Levitt and March, for example, in their analysis of, of organisational learning, um, have made the point that leaders of organisations, including political organisations, are inclined to accept paradigms that attribute organisational successes to their own actions and organisational failures to the actions of others or to external forces. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying before, that leaders of organisations will want to ensure that they claim or take the, you know, take credibility and take uh, some of the successes with them when things go right, but they'll be less inclined to uh, put their hands up and say when things went wrong and will often blame other factors for for that. Hood, Christopher Hood um, is an important um, scholar who has analysed the processes of, of blame games um, and also an analyses risk management within government and risk uh, within the public sector. And he basically contributes to this uh, debate on blame games and uh, he identifies that actually blame games more broadly is a perennial theme within political analysis and we need to ensure that its importance is maintained in studies in politics because it's, it tells us a huge amount about political behaviour. He goes on to argue that the literature of political science suggests three ways in which politicians or other public officials um, can try to limit or avoid blame. So he identifies three levels. Firstly, presentational strategies. This is known as spin doctoring or impression management. Uh, this is when often uh, official, official holders use justifications, excuses, diversionary tactics and so on. So um, somebody that would be regarded as a spin doctor that's probably uh, most well known as being a spin, spin doctor during the new Labour government was Alistair Campbell and he was often accused of using diversionary tactics and presentational strategies in trying to spin bad publicity into good publicity. Policy strategies is another level here so this relates to the choices made by policy makers that avoid or limit blame on purpose and, purposeful, and purposefully so um, and thus making uh, presentational strategies are necessary. So an example um, here is when the government actually identifies that there's a risk and puts the onus on um, on the individual. So for example with regards to fire safety there could be succinct messages like you know when it comes to using a smoke alarm you'll often hear the phrase 
excuses kill, fit a smoke alarm. So this uh, this is where policymakers can, by virtue of the fact that they're putting responsibility on the individual, is to limit blame on themselves by saying, look, you have the responsibility to fit this smoke alarm. It's not the state's fault if you don't do that. We've told you to do that, so the onus is on you. Okay, So that allows for um, blame limitation. There's also agency strategies. So this is when policymakers make a measured choice in organising or even orchestrating particular institutional arrangements that are expected to avoid blame. So, for example, by delegation. A few weeks ago in the lecture we were talking about the fact that how the civil service at the UK level has been split up from having key monolithic departments and it's been split up into different agencies. Right, which and those agencies are often headed up by chief executives who have responsibilities for the management and the budget of um, these agencies. So it basically means that ministers are able to delegate responsibility to these these exe chief executives. So if something goes wrong, it means that ministers can say it was the agency's fault. The agency isn't fit for purpose. It's not necessarily the political master, the government minister, that should be held to account. It should be the chief executive of the agency because they have the responsibility. They're paid well to take responsibility for that organisation. Therefore, it might mean that policymakers can organise for blame game in many respects through this process of delegation. Branstrom and Cooper's often link this debate about blame gaming to the framing literature. Um, and they, their analysis was quite fresh in that they kind of linked it with this literature. And framing really refers to how problems are identified, defined, and how they are, that is affected by ide ideologies and discourse. Um, and it's related to the agenda setting literature within public policy. And what that means is once an agenda has been set, a problem has been defined, that means that the decision making options as a result will be couched within how that issue has been defined. Okay, So the authors conceptualise crisis induced blame games as the, a decision tree in many ways that consists of strategic choices that affect actors in the accountability process. So they basically identify three dimensions, severity, agency and responsibility. So severity refers to whether core values have been violated, the degree to which political actors frame a series of events as violations of core public values determines to what extent these events become a matter of political or societal debate. So if the dominant definition of the situation is seen as non-political and not involving a threat to core values, then the events are depoliticised. So f actually framing events as crises, as opposed to something like an incident or a disturbance, can affect the definition of the situation mm. and what we would call shared con constructions of reality and the extent to which it becomes um, the subject of a political debate or a societal debate. At the agency level, this involves questioning whether the situation could be seen as an incident or a sy symptom of underlying policy failures. Boyne and colleagues contribute to this debate by arguing that if a situation occurs due to the symptoms of policy failure, then a crisis is usually depicted as something like a, a crisis waiting to happen. So in such a situation, the underlying causes lie back in history, so they intend to involve policy, strategic and top level types of factors. That's what Brad Strom and Coopers argue. Okay? So this means that events are depicted as operational inc inc incidents or symptoms of endemic problems okay so this is something that is something that's been creeping a creeping crisis that's just been a crisis waiting to happen some may actually argue that the global financial crisis could have been a crisis waiting to happen because the credit bubble burst uh, in many respects was that something that accumulated to a critical point maybe the, the underlying that was a failure to regulate the financial system so that lack of regulation led to a bubbling away of this risk and this risk became a threat and the threat became a crisis. So it became an endemic problem in many respects. 
Responsibility is another level which refers to when defenders or accusers of controversial policies use framing techniques to support their claims. So for example, this begs the question of whether events were caused by an actor or a network failure, for example. So this can have implications for lines of accountability and for, for blame game dynamics. It kind of goes back to what Batch and colleagues were talking about in terms of fuzzy governance and that network failure can actually make accountability processes quite difficult and can actually exacerbate the opportunity for blame. Just at a, a qualitative level, um, just from some of my own research, and this is from my book that will be published um, in the summer, um, which I've put a link to um, on the reference list, so if you're feeling really uh, interested, you can always buy it when it comes out. Uh, uh, just some snippets um, from the uh, interviews that are within the book. Um, you know, and this kind of gives you insight into how ministers often feel uh, when a, an inquiry has been set up. And um, what you'll find is that although we've we've kind of I think we've talked about this quote before, but it's interesting to revisit this uh, in this context. And that when the inquiry into foot and mouth was set up, the minister who was really uh, his performance was called into question uh, in terms of how he was dealing with the crisis especially at the early stages um, he was feeling quite um, upset about the, f the, the 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 inquiry and he basically said I formed a view very early that was going to be a script for the inquiry which was going to take the lines of useful minister useful pr useless prime minister useless military personnel useless uh, veterinary officials. So I felt, rightly or wrongly, that we were going to be scapegoats for the whole thing. So basically what Brown is saying, that there was going to be a process of blame games happening. And often, you know, he was going to take it personally. So he felt that there was going to be a script, there was going to be a blame game script for the whole process. So he was questioning the independence in many ways of the inquiry. So after New Labour was elected into government, um, um, after um, the foot and mouth crisis, um, the Minister of Agriculture, um, uh, who what, as was, uh, which is Nick Brown, uh, he was removed um, as the Secretary of State at Math, Math, and basically got what he said was, I got moved sideways and downwards to the Department for Working Pensions. And that's what he said. Uh, and and then um, his ministerial career um, went, um, went kind of downhill from there. Um, and it just shows you how you're exposed um, during a crisis period can have lasting um, effects on political careers and this did happen to, to Nick Brown uh, in many respects. So maybe the, when I was interviewing him there was a, maybe a bit of sour grapes there but he certainly evokes the sense that um, after the crisis when the, the inquiry was being set up that he was quite clear that there's going to be a process of blame gaming involved. I would also encourage you to look at other um, sources um, um, here with regards to blame games. There's some, some really good articles um, looking at some case studies. Uh, one example being Hurricane Katrina, the Boy Natal 2010 in public administration. And also the uh, McConnell et al. 2008 um, article in Australian Journal of Political Science looks at the role of the Howard, government's, uh, the Howard government in Australia with regards to the Iraq week stand scandal and basically both articles interrogate uh, the issue of blame gaming applied to these case studies and I think it's, it's a very useful um, tool or very useful sources for you to, to, to look at to kind of broaden your reading if you like um, in relation to blame games and how they apply to real life policy uh, and poly political case studies. To, by way of a summary, so the key things I want to, you to take out of the lecture uh, today um, is to think about communication as a fundamental, uh, a fundamental tool, if you like, or a fundamental approach to effective crisis management, which has external and internal dimensions. We can't forget the role of political language and the importance of political language um, by crisis management actors because political language is something that's within their toolbox, if you like, in the blame game process, okay? To try and avoid culpability by use of language um, for the response or how they handled a crisis. Fuzzy governance is quite a useful way to describe um, how things can be quite complex and how governments, governance systems can be quite complex, but also allows for political actors to undertake a blame game 
process. So fuzzy governance um, arguably helps to make blame games more possible. Also, um, improving communications is often a key lesson to be learned from crisis situations. Um, you, look, you can look at this um, from your own case studies, uh, but one of the things that uh, you will identify if that you, there is an inquiry attached to your case study that often communications and improving communications is a key lesson to be learned uh, from crisis situations. Next week we're going to look at the role of expertise in crisis management. Just to highlight the references and further reading that's attached to this lecture, um, the, uh, there are a range of sources, um, you'll see this, but I think that one of the things I'm trying to convey uh, to you all is the importance of wider reading. Extremely important going forward in terms of thinking about your assignments um, and also to kind of get the most out of the module. The lectures can only say so much and can direct you to the main themes um, of the module and the main themes um, of the politics of crisis. But really what you'll get is a breadth and depth of knowledge once you get your head into the reading. Uh, and also I've taken the opportunity to provide the, the reference to my own uh, text there. So keep your eyes out during the summer time if you really want to read more about animal health security and crisis management, then go ahead and do so. Um, but bro broadly, I think that it's important for next week to really get into the directed reading that I've provided on Moodle for you. There's three articles there that I want you to focus your attention on for uh, for next week in preparation for the seminar. The details are on the Moodle site. Also, I've provided a discussion board for this lecture specifically. So if you have any questions or queries or points you want me to, uh, to, to ask me about, um, please feel free uh, to post on to, the, to that forum uh, that's attached to this lecture on the Moodle page. Thank you.